Futurecast. Hi, and welcome to Deep Leadership. I'm your host, John Rennie. Well, I hope all is well with you today. It is Saturday morning, and I'm drinking a hot cup of Bottom Gun Coffee from my friends at BottomGunCoffee.com. I have another great show lined up for you, but before we get started, I just wanted to mention my latest leadership book. It's called You Have the Watch, and it's available on my website and on Amazon. In fact, it's a number one new release and a bestseller on Amazon. I'm really excited about this new book because it's not actually a book. It's a guided journal for leaders that will take you through an entire year of leadership training. There are 50 themes in the book, and each day you'll reflect on a different facet of that theme. This journal is designed to be on your desk at work for you to read and reflect on for about 15 minutes each morning. Leadership skills are like any other skills. You need to practice them to get better at them, and this journal helps you practice those skills. So if you're interested in this guided journal, go to youhavethewatch.com or Amazon and pick up your copy today. If you're looking for other ways to support what I do on the show, purchase any one of my books at johnsrenny.com. Podcast listeners can use the discount code DEEP at checkout to get additional savings. Also, I just wanted to mention that Deep Leadership is now ranked in the top 2.5% most popular shows out of 3 million podcasts globally, according to Listen Score. I wanted to thank each and every one of you for listening in every week and sharing these episodes with your friends. You have helped this podcast grow into a top performing show, and I wanted to thank you very much. Well, that is it. Today, we're going to be talking about the idea of giving back as a leader. Now, my guest is David Nordell. David grew up on a farm and then spent over 30 years in the Air Force and retired as a command chief master sergeant. He's had an amazing life and career, and we sat down and discussed the leadership lessons he learned along the way. Now, this was a very inspiring conversation that I know you'll enjoy. So, are you ready to dive in? Let's get started. Welcome to Deep Leadership. Leadership is a people business. That's the philosophy of your podcast host, John Rennie. As a former Cold War submarine officer who spent 20 plus years leading businesses in corporate America before starting his own manufacturing business, he knows that leadership matters. Leadership matters. Are you ready for some real world actionable advice from John as well as his expert guests? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Welcome to the Deep Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm joined by Dave Nordell. Dave is a retired United States Air Force Command Chief Master Sergeant with over 30 years of service. He served as a medic in Saudi Arabia, Somalia, South America, Iraq, Korea, Japan, and Hungary. He grew up in rural Northern California in a dairy farming community, and he's the author of a new book called Giving Back, Life and Leadership from the Farm to the Combat Zone and Beyond. And I am excited to have him on the show to talk about the idea of giving back as a leader. So Dave, welcome to the program. Hey, thanks, John. It's great. Great to be here with the Navy guy. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we are we love all the services. We've got a lot of Air Force uh, folks on here too. So we're happy to have you. And, uh, and I'm really excited about th- uh, learning from your background, your history, uh, and kind of this book, because I think there's it's a powerful message in there, and I really want to get to it. But first of all, tell us about your upbringing, because I think it's unique as you as you grew up in, the, in a dairy farming community on a farm, and then you decided to join the Air Force at 19. So tell us a little about the early days and why sure. you went into the Air Force in the first place. Sure. Well, the early days were all shaped by family immigrated from Portugal to the far northwest uh, of uh, California. And uh, after World War II, my grandfather bought uh, more property in the in the top of the Central Valley or the or the Northern California Valley, um, dairy farming. So as a little kid, um, I spent a lot of time. My dad left when I was young, so it was just me and my mom. And I spent an awful lot of time out on the farm. And uh, you know, I even as later on in life, and as the book the book kind of relates, you don't realize that almost everything you need to know about life and leadership is all there on the farm. You know, and it starts, the animals teach you a lot, but but the work that's necessary and the planning and the uh, critical thinking skills that go along with those type of things, uh, having a lot of empathy and, and patience and, and learning to uh, learning to overcome adversity, um, celebrate when you get the victories and uh, and understand that, uh, you know, you, you need help and how to ask for help and, and, and those type of things. So that farm experience, you know, it, life and death is all right there in front of you. So that farm experience you know, uh, I uh, I wanted to go in the Navy. We talked about it. I wanted to go in the Navy, and uh, and the recruiter 
the nicer recruiter on the day was the Air Force guy. So I ended up in the Air Force and I want to go in the Air Force and be a plumber. And the Air Force said, no, you probably need to be a medic. All of those were great decisions um, as far as I'm concerned. So I waited a year out of high school. I waited a year. I was on delayed enlistment. So I started in the Air Force uh, at 19 and then uh, and then off we went. And uh, the leadership lessons from the farm probably started right there in basic training. And I also learned that I had some growing up to do uh, um, based on uh, kind of who I was and what I was bringing into a very multicultural environment. And, uh, and so I started learning from people around me, too, which is a huge, huge key leadership trait, right? You know, you don't know everything. Uh, you got to find. Yeah. A yeah. Interesting. We talked a little bit off off the off the air, but, um, you know, when you. When you go in the military, people don't realize that it's just this diverse group of people from all over the country with every different religion, ethnicity, uh, region of the country, dialects. And and uh, in our case, they locked us in a metal tube for, you know, three months at a time. But um yeah, so you have to adjust, right, to to being around, you know, if you grew up in one particular area of the country and you, you're suddenly around people from Alabama and people from New York City. And and so w- what was that like for you, kind of that making that transition into, you know, being around a, 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 a wider group of people? Yeah, tough, tough chapter for me to write in the book. And if people, you know, if people want to absorb that, uh, as I was telling you earlier, I was thrown into diverse, equitable and inclusive environment right off in the bat. <laughs> And I was lucky. I had some. I had some uh, proficiency advanced army guys that were doing their, an abbreviated version of Air Force basic training. But the majority of my flight, the majority of them came from uh, upstate New York and inner city Philadelphia. Mm. And I'm coming. On, I'm coming from a town. I graduated with 125 kids that came from five different counties. And uh, and uh, so we had. You know, you had you had uh, social norms and you had a, a vocabulary and those type of things. And I found out really quick that that words and my vocabulary and things that were normal back at the hometown kitchen table weren't. Yeah. And my journey in leadership started right there with a lot of understanding, patience and empathy from some people that kind of started to explain things to me. And I made a decision on that day that if I didn't know something, I was going to go and find out. And if I didn't know somebody's story, I needed to know it because I, I wasn't going to be a good teammate, a good follower, and later on a good leader, unless you know people's story and you have to know what yeah. makes them tick because as you know you lock yourself up in a submarine and not everybody's motivated by uh, getting a shot at the treadmill they want to do something else so right yeah. yeah absolutely so you had a long you had a long uh career 30 years or so um tell us uh just some of uh, where what you did and where you went because it, it, it's I, I covered a little bit in the intro but you had a long long uh long history and the other thing is as you as you describe it talk to me a little bit when you felt like a shift where you know a lot of one thing i like about the military is you start out as a doer and then you 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 you're you're lead, you, you you know you gradually move into leadership and what was that transition like to you and when did you feel like oh truly i am a leader now and, and i'm doing more leading than i am doing because as an e9 you you're doing much more leading than you are doing so maybe tell a little bit about that sure yeah so um you know, I started as a straight leg medic. In fact, they made me a leader in basic training. I didn't know I had any traits. I don't know. Maybe they saw something. <laughs> maybe I was just the tallest guy in the flight and I got this, the job. I have no idea. Um, I started off uh, my first job. I went to Spain and my first job was delivering babies mm-hmm. and uh, working on an OB floor. And you can get an awful lot of responsibility as a young person. But when somebody in those delivery rooms, my job was the baby. So when the baby came out, the doctor handed me the baby and I had to do all things baby, give it enough oxygen, score them, make do all the fancy scores that go along with how healthy they are, get them warm, do all that type of stuff. Um, You start to become a critical thinker right there on the spot. Now, Mm. I'd seen a lot of animals born, so it wasn't it wasn't unusual to me. So you kind of progress and and you're leaning on leaders. But I'll tell you, you're going to laugh about this because that was my first assignment. I was a young airman. I had one stripe. I, I, when I left there, I had two stripes and I probably had one stripe on my sleeve. And I remember they had moved me to the emergency room and I stayed in the emergency room forever. That's what, that's what drove me to go to nursing school and become an ER nurse and to do that shock trauma stuff. And my, my uh, non-commissioned officer in charge got sick. Mm. And I kept walking by his office and there was all this paperwork laying on his desk and he's upstairs. And I'm thinking to myself, well, nobody's doing his job. What's the deal? I had no idea what I was doing, John, but I sat down and I made three piles of papers, mm. things that I thought that were irrelevant, 
things that I thought that somebody else needed to look at in the next week and things that needed to go upstairs to his, to his hospital bed for him to sign. And I grabbed another senior NCO out of the hallway and I said, Hey, I kind of did this. What do you think? And he goes, well, I guess you're just the AIC, you know, the airman in charge and off he went. And so I, I started and I got, I got a lot of praise for doing that, but um, I started to find out that if you're going to take the initiative and get in front of things, you can lead from any spot. Mm. And so, so as I graduated through through the ranks, as I was, as I was moving up, and I got different jobs, and as I told you, they sent me to independent duty school. And on the submarine, you know, the doc is the doc does a lot of stuff, and and uh, and we did too in the Air Force. And then you're out, and then you're the then you're the you know when you're in the jungles of South America chasing around drug runners. You're the doc and you're the senior, you're the senior medical advisor, and you're sitting yep. on those executive teams, even though they're small, and you're making those executive decisions. So I think in my formative years, um, I was leading. I didn't know how. I made some mistakes and I had some mentors. You know, mentorship is a huge piece. I had some mentors that kind of picked me up and and moved me down the line. All the way to my last job, I got I had three command billets, and my last job was a command chief at 20th Air Force. And so now you're leading nuclear forces and missileers and a lot of cops and and all the adjuncts that go along with that and, and and the bases and then you're back right back to the lessons of basic training and that large diverse group and you know in the book i talk a lot about you don't know what you don't know so you better not waste your time and go find out wondering you know don't sit around wondering because once you get to know somebody's story you can build some respect and you can actually make some really good decisions change lives and i had the opportunity to do that so it's great yeah, I really like what you're saying there because that's a big part of leadership is connecting and, and getting to know people and knowing, you know, there's no cookie cutter approach to leadership. If you know your people and you know what motivates them and, you know, what, where their issues are and what where their hopes and dreams are, you can lead them a lot better than if you, you're you trying to do one size fits all. So, yeah, that's something I definitely learned over, over the years as well. You know? That's the adage, you know, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care about them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you yeah. shut your mouth, shut your mouth and listen. That's <laughs> his yeah. first step in leadership. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. that's that's in the book, right? I, I had my lesson. Absolutely. So let's talk about this new book. It's called uh, Giving Back Life and Leadership from the Farm to the Combat Zone and Beyond. Now, who were who did you have in mind when you wrote this book? You know, if this is gonna sound so cliche. I actually in my in my head, I had everybody in mind because. I didn't want to write to young airmen, you know, today's airmen. And I didn't right. want to write, I didn't want to write to, to, you know, the mid-level manager and, and all the, and, you know, all the kind of the, the categories we put people in. But really what I, my thought processes were is my grandfather was a giver. He died, he died young. He died at 65. He was a giver and he found a magical way. People just gravitated to him because uh, he didn't, um, he didn't hoard the gifts of life. He knew that it needed to be given back. And so in my time on earth, as people will say, sometimes they're like, wow, you, you kind of live the lives of maybe two or three people. And, and I don't know if that's the case, but life has taken me in a, in, a, in a way that I've got to experience a lot of things. And so why wouldn't you write it down or why wouldn't you share it? And so I think that the population that this is resonating the most with is somewhere between seventh grade and geriatric millennials. Mm. And it's these people that are hungry for those little tidbits of, of clues to be introspective. And I think people that, that just need a regrounding, the book is there. It just kind of drags you back to the basics. Um, the basic things that we need to take care of ourselves on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, your workout, your workout guy, and you take care of your physical piece. That's important. Yeah. Uh, you know, and the, and the people that you keep around you and those type of things. And, and so, you know, that's what the, the book is there for. I think anybody can read it. I'll give you an example. My 88-year-old mother read it, called me in tears and said, you wrote this book 40 years too late because I should have had it back then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's. I think it's great. And I think, you know, it sounds like you were motivated similar to me, which was, you know, I wanted to, we're going to talk about this. I wanted to give back, right? I, I, I've, I've been blessed with a, an extraordinary life as well and got to do some amazing things. Uh, and I want to share that wisdom. I want to share my experiences. I want to help 
the next generation of leaders, you know, maybe not make the mistakes I made, you know, and here, here's a few little shortcuts that I learned from 30 years of doing this, right? So, um, so I think, you know, probably some of that was your motivation as well as this idea of, of giving back. And, and let's talk about that. So the book is called Giving Back. So why is giving back uh, so important and who should give back? Are we talking leaders? Are we talking everyone? What, what, tell, tell, tell us a little bit about, like you mentioned your grandfather, but what does it mean by giving back? Sure. So as we travel through life and we have experiences, we have some similar experiences, I think, John, when, when we're, all these things we've been talking about, you're exposed to certain people, certain situations, certain cultures, uh, certain traumas uh, that shape you that are all kind of inside of you. And I look at each and every one of those as a gift. And so you can hoard the gifts. You can just keep them, right? And they can mm -hmm. be yours and, and you can sit on the chair and the only person that ever gets to hear it is maybe your great, great grandson when you decide to, to spill it all in your last your last moments on earth. Or you can share the gifts. You know, I I think in the book, one of my one-liners in there is, is knowledge is power only when shared. Yeah. And we can know a whole lot about a lot, John. And we can we can actually tell people I'm really smart, you know, or or you know, pound our chest. But I think that the power, you know, the really, the really smart people and the really, the people that are really involved in in growth and development of our world and and the people in it are the ones that give back the gifts. And so, in that book, and I, I preface it at the beginning, there's nuggets in there, and if somebody just gets one nugget out of the book, then the book is is a success. And I haven't, uh, you know, I've had people call me that I haven't seen for 25 years to that have read the book and said, this is amazing because you've pulled me back. You've regrounded me into places that I have kind of strayed away from. And yeah. so some of it's very simple and some of it's complex, but yeah, it's, yeah, I think it's our responsibility. Yeah, I, I do. I do. As, as we grow older, this is a, this is a finite gig life. And so uh, I just would just soon leave it all out there. I, I love it. I, yeah. I, I understand it completely because that's what I'm trying to do as well. So that's fantastic. Um, you said this and I, and I like it and I think it's really important uh, and I want to unpack it a little bit. You say that leaders are appointed and anointed only by their peers and followers. This is interesting. So a military guy saying this, I thought it was all about rank, Dave. So right. no, it's about you're, you're appointed and anointed only by peers and followers. What does, what does that mean? So kind of backwards, forwards. So late in my career, one of the responsibilities of senior non-commissioned officers and especially chiefs is to raise the young officers, right? Keep them out of trouble. And, and you know, in the Navy, you can't even go talk. You can't even go talk to the boss without a without a, a senior NCO next to you when you're. Oh, you we we took care of our chiefs, believe yeah. me, because they, they took care of us. <laughs> right, exactly. And that's the way. And, that, and, you know, that's that's kind of the way it is. But. Um, some of that comes to my exposure to the civilian world, and some of that comes from being around some officers that got wayward and mm. some senior non-commissioned officers that got wayward. And what I mean by that is, is that you can get a job. You can get a promotion, right? In the Navy, it's a big deal to make chief. I mean, they give you a brand new uniform and they, you know, there's a whole, that's a, that's a week long event. It's a big deal. Yeah. Well, you, that can go to your head, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden you can start tapping your anchors. And saying, well, I'm a chief, right? But being a chief doesn't make you a leader. The yeah. people, when, you're, when your people are going, that's my chief, that's my colonel, that's my captain. When people are doing that, they're anointing you as a leader because they trust you. You've developed those relationships that go along with those type of things. And, and, and there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a level of respect that is earned. Hmm. There's respect that is there's respect that's implied and there's respect that's earned. Yeah. That earned respect is what anoints you as being a leader. And you can't get that from from looking in the mirror or tapping on your rank or, or, or looking at your job title or whatever your signature block is in an email. You don't get it from that. You get it from the acknowledgement of your of your peers and your followers that you're somebody that they trust either to go to the fight with or to lead them through, you know, budget time in the, in the organization, whatever it is, you need to be that guy or that gal uh, to do that. And so I used to tell people, 80, especially the young officers, 80% of the promotions you'll get in the United States Air Force, you'll be pushed pushed up by 80%. The other 20 you are pulled up. So spend, spend that about that amount of time taking care of that batch. Because if you take care of your followers at the right level, uh, not only will they tell people that you're a leader, um, they'll help you be a better leader and they'll push you on to the next leadership opportunity. 
Yeah, that's just just so so powerful, so important uh, that, uh, and I think that uh, especially what I write about is is in business leaders, people who are individual contributors, they get promoted to manager, and then some just kind of they take that power and it goes to their head, and they become this, you know, look, I've got the title now, I'm going to tell you what to do, type of thing, and and um, as you mentioned, wayward uh, junior officers, I saw a lot of wayward managers in my time in corporate that. Uh, Took took the position to their heads and and uh, and no you know at the end of the day nobody followed them because they just just didn't respect th- th- that individual you know right. and so you earn that respect by doing your job doing it very well and taking care of the people around you and 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 you know as I mentioned earlier shutting up and listening and <laughs> and observing especially as a junior officer I learned very very early on to keep my mouth shut and do a lot of listening and asking clarifying questions <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so there's a ton of lessons. There's this book is filled with stories, filled with lessons, and uh, so I want to talk a few about a few of them, and and then uh, maybe have you share some of the stories in the book. Yeah. But uh, uh, one of the one of the ones you had was uh, you said uh, you need to listen. Uh, what or I'll ask you, what does it mean to listen on a three by five note card? I like that one. That was a little yeah. bit unique to this book. So what do you mean by listen with a three by five note card? So I was lucky enough to be hand selected to go start the unmanned aerial vehicle program for the air force out in Indian Springs. And it was a pretty dynamic environment because all of the support staff, medics and admin staff, all of the support functions, um, that were coming in there were all kind of handpicked by by man, functional managers to, you know, they wanted to make sure that that worked right. But the Air Force put every permanently disqualified pilot and some old F-4 maintainers, they threw them all in this mix. So we had this disgruntled <laughs> group and we had this high speed group that was all together. And we all had a lot of good ideas, but um, as we're creating things on legal pads, I mean, we're writing tech orders on legal pads. As we're creating things, Everybody had ideas and I was young and full of ideas. And there was a reason I was there. There was a reason why all of us were there. I mean, we had accomplished some things in our career up to that point. And I would go to these meetings and I would just get going. I mean, Mm -hmm. I was just laying it out, you know, and I had it all done. And one time I left the meeting and I was feeling big and bold, you know, boy, I had told them and my E8 at the time, he kind of grabbed me and he said, he goes, you know what he says, Dave, he goes, you're really smart and you have a lot of good ideas. And all of them are going to go right down the toilet until you learn how to shut your mouth. Mm. He said, because other people have good ideas. And if you stop talking, they'll probably take your good idea, make it a little bit better, and then yes. you can move on. Yes. And and so I to this day, to I even ran into a high school teacher that that wrote on my report card that I talked too much. I said, You nailed it. So it's it's good. <laughs> But at that point, at that moment in time, I went back to my office, I took out a three by five card and in block letters, I wrote the word listen on it. And I stuffed it in my front left hand pocket. And for a long time, I would take anything that was important, I would take it with me to do, you know, to, to, to touch or to pull out and to look at when I really wanted to transmit and I needed to be in the other form of communication, which was listening. And so some people will tell you I still get distracted, but I am a lot better, a lot better at it today. And I still think I stink. So it's it's one of the it's it's the it's the most poorly practiced communication skill that we have. Yeah. And people will say, people will say, Well, I think I'm a good listener. And I'll say, go ask the people that you work for. And yeah. nine times out of ten, they come back and they go, Oh, I got some work to do. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause if, if you can master that skill, boy, the respect you get from your from your work, from your followers we'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors leadership skills are like any other skills you need to practice them to get better at them best-selling leadership author john s rennie knows this that's why he's written a new book called you have the watch it's a guided journal for leaders designed to take you through an entire year of leadership training by the end of the year you will master 50 of the most important leadership skills if you want to have a greater impact on the results and people in your organization go to youhavethewatch.com and pick up your copy today This episode is brought to you by the Fraternity of Excellence. The Fraternity of Excellence is an online and real-world community for men who are looking to improve in all areas of their lives. The men of FOE are working together to become better husbands, fathers, and leaders at work and in their communities. 
They live by a simple philosophy. As iron sharpens iron, so one man sharpens another. Now, I've been a member for more than three years, and for me, I finally found a brotherhood of men that I was missing from my time in the military. Now, I love being around guys who are dedicated to becoming a better version of themselves. So if you're interested in becoming a man of excellence as well, go to fraternityofexcellence.com, or you can reach out directly to me to learn more. You know, I've talked on this podcast before, you know, my first, uh, I was 32 when I got my first manufacturing plant. And uh, I remember thinking I had to have all the answers. And, and it was a bit intimidating, because I had people that were working at that plant that had been there almost 30 years, you know, so, uh, and I remember thinking, well, I have to have all the answers. And and, and it, over over time in leading that plan, I learned that everything I, all the knowledge that I needed to run that business was, was in the minds of my employees. But I had to ask them and I had to listen and I had to, to, to be quiet and be humble enough to let those ideas flow. And of course, as a leader, you have to make the final decision. But, but at the end of the day, man, um, what I learned is when I shut up and I let them speak, is that there was this rich, and, and, and it was a lot of pent up ideas, like the other management team wouldn't listen. So, so when they had finally had a boss that was going to shut this, just said, tell me what you think would work in this scenario. They were like, you know, it just all came out because they would, it was all pent up. And uh, I mean, so many great ideas and none of them came from me. And, and that's the one thing. And, and uh, the other thing is I learned is that the quietest person in the room usually has the best idea because they're they're thinking why the rest of the people are talking. And so I'm always careful now to always look for that like person that's not really talking too much. And uh, and usually they'll say one thing that just changes the whole dynamic of the of the room. So yeah, I think listening and um is 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 essential to leadership. And I, I'm glad you brought that up. You had you had two really good ones there. One is mining your introverts. Yes. Because they get run over by the extroverts. Yes. And, yeah. and the second thing is that deference to expertise. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, I mean, that has to be a core value in some institutions. I mean, we pick integrity and we pick all these. Mm. The, I think deference to expertise is the yeah. highest level of respect you can pay to anybody. I, I agree. And, and even now that I'm kind of an expert in a lot of different areas, especially in my industry, I've been doing it for a long time. I'll actually let the young engineers run with something, even though I kind of know that's probably not the right idea, but I want them to make the mistake and I want them to try it and I want them to feel like it's their idea. So as I've gotten older, it's it's been a little bit more like I'm kind of the expert in this one, but I'm going to let it go because I want to see where where this individual individual is going to be take it. So it's part of it is just, you know, you even if you are the expert, sometimes it's good to hear what other people are thinking and it's good to let them try try their idea, you know, because they own it. Once they say, this, this is my idea and I got a chance to try it, they're, they're the, they have the ownership. It's not, it's not my monkey, it's their monkey now. So right. Yeah. Right. yeah. That's, great. that's, that's, that's great about that. <laughs> so, Perfect. Um, so let's see, one, one of the things I really like, and, and you and I think alike in this, is you said, do the best job in the job you're in. Stop looking up, uh, aspire, but don't desire. And right. this is a source of frustration to me. I saw so many people in corporate planning and thinking and acting uh, so they could get their next job versus doing the job that they had very well. So talk about that in, in, in what you and, wrote about. And they want the checklist, right? Yeah, when, yeah. When I, made, when I made E9, if somebody tapped me on the shoulder one more time and said, how did you make chief? <laughs> you know what my answer would be? I turned around and I said, I did the best job in the job I was in. And then the next promotion and the next job came after that. And, but I watched too many, I watched my peers, sadly, I watched some peers that I came up through the air force with and it gets, the community gets really thin when you get into those command billets because oh, yeah. there's not a lot of us. And um, um, I watched people start to have a desire mm -hmm. to be the next thing instead of aspiring to that, instead of doing the work that went along with that, they, you could just see them say, that's where I want to be. And then they got into this. First of all, their personalities changed. The way they dressed changed. They weren't the same people that I knew. They stopped having fun and they were doing things that were not natural for them. They thought that they had masked it over and they did. You know, it's just like somebody that's, that's, um, that doesn't play golf very well. 
And then they go out on the course and they think, oh, yeah, I've got them all fooled. And you know, because you're in the woods and you're on 10 strokes on one hole. And yep. everybody's like, this guy can't play golf. It doesn't matter what type of facade. It doesn't matter how you dress or if you got the best clubs. If you show up and you can't play, you probably weren't doing the work. Yeah. And so, yeah, it's it's it. I, I wrote that chapter. That chapter is for those young millennials, because the young millennials, when you're leading them, they're always looking two or three jobs ahead and going, well, I want to be that guy. And how much does he make? And I yeah, always tell them, yeah. stop. Because the only way to get five years experience doing something is you have to do it for five years. There's no accelerated plan. Right. Do that. Right. So why don't you just knock it out of the park where you're at? People will notice you, even, even the introverts. People will notice you and they'll advance you, advance you along because of the hard work you're doing. So I just, it, you know, it almost ties back to, to the, um, don't get wrapped around your title and your rank, right? It's all yeah. kind of in yeah. there. Yeah. Uh, and it's Absolutely. keep it real and staying humble. And, yeah. Yeah. And I would say this to anyone who's listening and say, well, I'll, you know, that's, I don't believe in that. I, you know, I got to keep looking to the next level. I got to keep acting like that next level is that my entire career, my wife said, is I was dragged kicking and screaming up the corporate ladder. Like I never desired for anything other than to do my job really well. And I kept getting more and more responsibility. Uh, and I spent most of my career as a vice president, uh, general manager of businesses and, and, uh, and, and, and coming from like really no background. And I don't have a family that was, you know, business leader or anything like that. It's just that I, I did my job well and I worked really hard and I took care of my people and I, and I carried out the mission and, uh, and, and really people will notice and people saw like, you know, Rennie gets things done, you know, and you built a reputation for, for someone who's getting things done. And then they gave you more, they gave me more and more responsibility. So I think that's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm living proof that it does work that way. Right. And people give you pieces and parts of their job. You don't even realize it. they're grooming you. They're taking yes. something they do and giving it to you. And then when you get up there, you're like, Oh, that's, I already do that. You know? Right. So, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I love that. So, cause I really do believe in that. I see way too many people thinking about the next job and not doing the current job really well. So um the next question, don't hoard your grits. <laughs> I love that one. So what do you mean by that? Well, grits and gifts, right? It's, yeah. the, it's all kind of, it's all kind of, all kind of um, uh, molds together. Uh, and it goes back to, to what I was talking about. There's, there's some things that disturbed me that made me write a few things. And, and one of them was, you know, knowledge is power only when shared. Hmm. And sometimes what happens is, is, is you get a nugget and then somebody's like, well, I'm not going to share this. You know, I've been working really yeah. hard to get this nugget. Yeah. And I think that they have the power structure upside down. And so you got to, you got to share, you have to share when you get something. I'm, that is one thing, John, that I've been really, it's been really easy for me my whole life. I get something and I'm like, Hey, let's look at this and let's, and, and sometimes I've been burned. I've had people run off and go, hey, look at this. And all of a sudden, it's their idea. Right. And it's going. I had a general one time. This guy was brilliant when he did this. We was we would have some intimate conversations. And he would write notes when I, while I was talking sometimes. And he looked up at me one day and he said, he goes, chief, he goes, we're going to walk out of this room. And I'm going to say some of these things that I've written down here. And he goes, unfortunately, they have to be my ideas. And I hope you're okay with that. <laughs> yes yeah and yeah. and i told him yes i yeah. said i'm absolutely fine with that you know you yeah. got it you have to you've got you, it's it's for the betterment of the masses the growth of the followers and that's yeah. how you build you build respect far too often you get into a room somebody's holding a nugget a guy's giving a briefing or he's trying to to solve a problem and then and then the the non-giver in the back of the room goes well that can't be right because x equals x and x and y and, and it, it blows the whole thing up. And you're like, well, why didn't you tell? We've talked about this 10 times. Why didn't you tell me that? Yeah. And that is so destructive to an organization. But it also kills your followers, right? Yeah. When people see that, then all of a sudden they'll, they'll run and hide. and They won't participate anymore because there's this unknown thing. And Yeah, that's kind of deep. I don't, I don't know where, you know, where you feel on that. But I just think the more you share, the better. Not everybody needs to know everything but they definitely need to know as much as you can share appropriately. 
Oh, I think it's I think it builds relationships. I mean, I think it's 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 how you become a trusted boss. It's how you become a trusted peer is if you're willing to share, you're not holding information tight to your vest. The worst bosses I ever saw in corporate were people that were they get a little nugget of information, they'd hold it tight because that was going to be their ticket to the next level or their ticket to get to look good in front of the boss or whatever. And uh I've never been that way. I've always been like this is going to help our the overall business. You know, why would I hold this? You know, I'll share it with even a competitive sure. division or a competitive plant within my division because I want them. Because if they improve, we all you know we, we you know we we improve the whole division. So why would I hold back on some of this stuff? And and but I saw some boss uh, some some of my peers that would hold the they get an idea and they'd hold it tight and they'd hide it because they thought it was their little competitive advantage. You know. You know, for your corporate audience, if you watch the Netflix stuff on the Boeing, the Boeing disaster with a 737 mm-hmm. Max, mm-hmm. that was going on. Yeah. That was a exactly. big that was a big part of that failure. Yeah. 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 It's it there's a lot of CYA. There's a lot of uh I I know something that's gonna help me, you know, get, you know, move up my career. Uh, you know, it's compartmentalization, you know, where, you know, I'm just going to, I've got my little kingdom. I'm going to take care of my kingdom, make sure I get budget for next year. Yeah. I, I saw a lot of that and it's, 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 it's very destructive, destructive and it's not, it does not help the company advance. And in fact, it hurts the company. No, it takes a little courage to do that. If that's not normal for you, yeah. you've got to step out there and, and be a little vulnerable with it. But yeah. I'm, yeah. Wow. I, that's great. And, and so, um, I was going to say, what, what are, maybe, maybe tell us another story from the book that's kind of uniquely you, because uh, we, you know, I picked a few, but uh, there's, sure. there's somebody in here. The one, the, uh, t- the one that I think resonates the most with people that I've gotten feedback on. Um, I'm working on a second book, and it may, it may center around this. Um, a quick story. I'll make it as quick as I can. When I was getting ready to go to Iraq for my last combat tour, I was going to be the chief of the trauma center for the whole theater in Iraq. Um, that's a moving and shaking place. There's a lot going on. Helicopters are landing and everything's on it. Everything from four month old children to, to our men and women in arms and, and families and even, even the terrorists. And we took care of everybody. Um, uh, when you're going in there and you got over 200 some odd people that you got to get to mesh and make all of that work, uh, and, and, and get to things. I had to think really hard. How do you do that? How do you create an attitude where it's a positive attitude? It's a good attitude. Get wrapped around an idea um, that can carry people through day to day. And uh, so I came up with two things. One was I hate doing pushups, John. I hate them. (laughs) So I said, I'm going to do pushups while I'm gone and everybody's going to do them with me. And the second thing was, was uh, something to, to key off of attitude. And so early on, uh, when I'd walk, walk into work, my days were 16 to 18 hour days. When I'd walk into the trauma center, we had a chaplain there 24 hours a day. So I'd get on my knees, literally on my knees, and I'd have them pray on me. And I, I learned really quick that one day it would be a rabbi, and the next day it would be a Baptist minister. And the That's next the day military. Priest. <laughs> they all say the same words, and the feeling is the same, and it's all good stuff. So, um, so that was number one. And then number two is I would hit, usually I would stop in the command section. So it was mainly our administrative people. And I, we'd started with five push-ups. I said, we're going to do five push-ups. And we'd do five push-ups. And then there was always the question of, Chief, how are you doing today? And I would say, maximum fabulous. And they'd say, what? And I'd say, that is the top of the rung of attitude that you can have in the entire planet. It's maximum fabulous. And I, that's, I said, if I'm not there right now, by the end of the day, that's where I'm going to be. And I said, you should be too. And so this went on for months. Push-ups, I'd do about 140 to 160 push-ups by the time I was done seeing everybody. The question was always the same. Chief, how are you doing? Maximum fabulous. They would all laugh. They would say, how do you get to max fab? I said, you just got to work on it. That said, that <laughs> there's, there's no reason not to be that way. Yeah. So when I was going to leave, the, the boss asked me, he says, well, what do you want? And I told him I wanted one of the American flags at a hero's highway. And our survival rate um, through that whole, con- that whole conflict in the time that I was there if you were breathing and you hit our hospital, you had a 99.5% chance mm-hmm. of going home alive. And that's pretty good. And so, you know, you'd think that Max Fab contributed to that. They took the uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent flag off of the top of the hospital that's mandatory by Geneva Convention to fly over the medical facilities. They took that down and they gave it to me. And as I did say, it's in my, it's in my uh, garage. I see it every day when I park. And uh, 
they embroidered my name on it and the time that I was there. But on the bottom of that flag, it says Maximum Fagans. Mm, I love it. And uh, and so I think I went back and visited some of those folks in San Antonio when I got back and, and they picked me up and kind of gave me a little VIP treatment. And uh, I think that they a lot of them attribute their ability to survive mentally through that. Um, yep. through just a couple of push-ups and uh, and working towards maximum fab every day. So, and the people that have read the book, they 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 write me emails now and they sign them max fab. So it's good. I love that story, and that's why I wanted to hear. And I'm glad to hear that you told it uh, because you know leader leaders were our attitude is contagious. You know, if we're down in the dumps, it's everyone's going to be down in the dumps. And if you come in and you're max fab every day, <laughs> or at least trying to get there, right? Uh, then that attitude's going to uh, yeah, it's going to it's going to catch on, and that's a powerful story. And uh, and there's lives saved because of that, and that's great to hear. Yeah, that's great to hear. Well, Dave, this has been fantastic. How can our listeners find out more about uh, your new book and more about you? Sure. Well, read the book. Um, <laughs> it's on Amazon. It's on Barnes & Noble and uh, Balboa Press. Uh, so, yeah, go out and check out the book. Um, they can get a hold of me at uh, um, uh, at Dave Nordell on Twitter is probably the best way uh, to get a hold of me. And uh, we can have we can have some wonderful conversations on there. I do have a website. I speak professionally uh, to do some of this motivational stuff and talk a little Max Fab and talk a little bit of attitude and and uh, do some motivational things. And obviously the coaching things that go along with people that feel like they may just need a little bit of a of a different flavor from somebody that's had a little bit different experience and and those type of things. So yeah, really, I, the easiest way. Most people are on Twitter at Dave Nordell uh, on Twitter, and then my uh, my um, website is. One man, one plan, MT for Montana.com. One man, one plan, MT is in Mike Tango.com. Uh, I'm up here in Billings, Montana, and it's gorgeous country and gorgeous people. And they named a ship after our city. So we've got the Navy, the Navy's <laughs> got a got a USS Billings now. So it's great. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm, well, I'm just I'm just here to give back, John. So if people need me, uh, have me holler and uh, please uh, take time to read the book. It's a quick read, as you know. So, and yeah. I think it's helpful. Absolutely. So we'll put links in the show notes uh, for those resources. And, you know, again, I, uh, leaders, I encourage you to take a look at it. It's called uh, Giving Back Life and Leadership from the Farm to the Combat Zone and Beyond. And there's a lot of great stories in it. We just scratched the surface. Dave, thank you for coming on the show and sharing all of these, all your experiences and all of this wisdom. I really appreciate it. You bet. Thanks so much, John. Thanks again. Well, that's it for today. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. If you like this podcast, please subscribe and share so we can continue to build a world with better bosses. Until next time, this is John Rennie saying take care and lead well. Thank you for listening to Deep Leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all you do. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. For more information and updates, please visit our website at www.deepleadershippodcast.com or johnsrenny.com. Until next time, take care. Hey there, I'm DC. I host the Rock Podcast, Back to the Arena, the Interviews. It's about a 30-minute podcast where I talk one-on-one -on -one with a band who has released new music. You can find us on all the best podcast sites like Spotify, Apple, Google, iHeartRadio, and more. If you're a rock fan like me, subscribe today to Back to the Arena, the interview. Electric Acid. Step inside the marketing mirror to uncover marketing secrets, discover gems, tactics, lessons, and campaigns you can use, next gen or fundamentals. Grab the marketing magic to improve your marketing and win more business. Electric Acid.